Hello, welcome back to the world of Ikerd, where we learn how to think like the college board so you can get a five on the AP exam. Today, we're on to unit four, transoceanic interconnections, 1450 to 1750. Where shall we begin? Same old place we always do. The course and exam description. Here's the required content for 4.1, technological innovations. Knowledge, scientific learning, and technology spread from three main sources, the classical world, the Islamic world, and the Asian world. They spread in particular to Europe, which then facilitated European technological developments and innovations. These Euro European technological developments included new tools, innovations in ship designs, and an improved understanding of regional winds and currents patterns. These developments all made transoceanic trade possible. So innovations are helping to facilitate trade. Reminds me of Unit 2. Yes, Unit 2 had many examples of technology helping to increase trade and increase the geographic range of that trade. In fact, we're talking about a lot of the same technologies, especially from 2.3 Indian Ocean trade routes, like latin sails from the Islamic world and the compass from China. Knowledge of geography from ancient Greek thinkers like Ptolemy had also been rediscovered and translated by Islamic scholars. These scholars had also added their own innovations and developed better astronomical charts. In Units 1 and 2, we learned about how ideas were transferred from Asia and the Islamic world to other other parts of the world, particularly Europe. Now in Unit 4, we see what the Europeans do when they adopt these technologies and add some of their own innovations. Let's look at improvements in ship designs and start with the Caravel, developed by the Portuguese. These ships were equipped with multiple latin sails, triangular sails which allowed for sailing close to the wind. They were also equipped with rudders, which allowed for the ability to better steer the vessel. It's important to note that these were borrowed technologies, but the Europeans had added some of their own significant innovations, such as improvements in the hull that allowed for better maneuverability and steadiness on the open seas. It was even sometimes capable of sailing up rivers. The combination was a ship highly suitable for going places never before reached by sea. The Carrick was similar to the Caravel, but was larger and more suitable for travel and trade, since it could carry more goods and people. In later years, the Dutch developed the Flute, which could carry even more cargo and was relatively cheap to produce, making it even more ideal for trade. In addition to building better ships, the Europeans were also studying the patterns of winds, like the westerlies and the trade winds, as well as ocean currents, such as the Canary Current and the Gulf Stream. This knowledge facilitated travel across farther distances and to new places, down the coast of Africa and across the Atlantic Ocean. Reminds me of monsoon winds in the Indian Ocean. Yes. Again, it's very similar. Sounds like there's a lot of continuities and changes. Get used to that. That's what Unit 4 is all about. Now let's take a look at 4.2, Exploration, Causes, and Events. State-sponsored transoceanic maritime exploration occurred in 1450 to 1750. So governments are paying upfront, especially European governments. Why would governments pay for these risky ventures? What are the causes of them doing so? They wanted access to luxury goods from Asia. Exactly. We saw in Unit 2 how societies throughout Afro-Eurasia were becoming more connected through networks of exchange, and Europeans were developing a taste for Asian goods. Spices. Yes, spices, silk, and a lot of other stuff. But Europe was at the far end of these trade routes. These goods had to travel across vast distances and required many different merchants to do so. And each of those merchants was raising the price to make a profit. We also saw in Unit 3 how these large Asian states were becoming more effective at collecting taxes. So in order for a luxury good to get to Western Europe, it would have been taxed by multiple powerful governments, especially the Ottoman Empire. So the Europeans were looking for other ways to get access to these Asian goods, and for the Portuguese, that meant to sail around Africa. The Portuguese kingdom sponsored this adventure, partially because of the influence of Prince Henry the Navigator. The goal of reaching India took generations, and Vasco da Gama finally arrived there in 1498. Along the way, they had developed a trading post empire, which was made of a series of what were called factories. All along the coast of West, Southern, and East Africa, the Middle East, India, and Southeast Asia, the Portuguese were setting up factories and engaging in trade, and often warfare. They used their advantages in ship design and cannon technology to blast their way into many of these places. And they used their naval power in the region to establish a monopoly over the spice trade, which they enforced with the Cartaz system. Any ship that didn't have a Cartaz would face serious consequences. 
The Spanish government, most famously Queen Isabella and King Ferdinand, also sponsored voyages of exploration. Because of this state-sponsored support, in 1492, Columbus was able to take three ships across the Atlantic Ocean, two caravels and one carrack. Columbus was looking for what he thought was a more direct route to the riches of Asia. But of course he ran into some big obstacles that we now call the Americas. More on that later. But the success of his voyage led Northern Europeans, the Dutch, the English, and the French, to make their own voyages across the Atlantic. They too were still trying to establish trade routes to Asia, looking for the elusive Northwest Passage. They never found it, because it doesn't exist. But all of these Europeans found ways to extract wealth out of this new world. And these voyages were largely sponsored by the governments of these states. Now let's talk about the Columbian Exchange which for the College Board is an environmental development. We're referring to the exchange of plants, animals, and diseases between the Eastern and Western Hemispheres. Let's start with diseases. When the Europeans and later Africans arrived to the Americas, they brought with them diseases that had been in Afro-Eurasia for centuries, like smallpox, measles, and malaria. But these diseases were new to the Americas, and local populations had virtually no immunity to them, and often led to catastrophic levels of population decline. In some places as much as 90% of populations may have been wiped out. These widespread deadly epidemics in the Americas are collectively called the Great Dying. Europeans also brought disease vectors like mosquitoes and rats. Reminds me of the bubonic plague. Yes, another good comparison with Unit 2. Now let's talk about plants and animals. Foods originally from the Americas would become staple crops for people in Afro-Eurasia, meaning that they became principal parts of their diets. For example, potatoes from South America and maize from Central America. This well-known public domain infographic shows us some more examples. These new crops were often calorie dense and able to survive climate and weather conditions better than what was previously available. Because of the increase in food sources, this facility facilitated population growth. Reminds me of Chumpa Rice. <laughs> and bananas in Africa. Excellent observations. Just like we saw in previous units, introduction of new food sources can facilitate population growth. That's a continuity in world history. But the scale and diversity of these new food sources, and the speed at which they spread to new places, was unprecedented. So the Columbian Exchange is also an enormous change. Some historians have argued the single most important change in world history. And it didn't just change the diets of people in the old world. People in the New World got all kinds of new plants and animals. Afro-Eurasian fruit trees, grains, sugar, and domesticated animals. Animals like cows were used to produce beef and dairy products, but were also used as draft animals. Horses were used for hunting and warfare, transforming the practices of many indigenous American societies. Many of these new plants and animals were brought by Europeans. But you also need to know that enslaved Africans also brought important transformational crops to the Americas, particularly okra, and more importantly, importantly, rice. The transatlantic slave trade, probably the most tragic and infamous development in modern world history, also had its roots in the Columbian Exchange. This was because of another major introduction of new crops to the Americas, cash crops. Cash crops were grown for the goal of pure profit. There were many cash crops in this period, notably coffee and tobacco, but the most important one was sugar. By this time, people in many parts of the world, especially in Europe and the Middle East, had become addicted to sugar, and they were willing to pay a high price for it, which made it a very profitable thing to grow. But it was also very labor-intensive and grew in tropical climates that were often deadly to people putting in hard labor. Since almost no one would willingly do this kind of work, the plantation owners relied on coercive labor systems, including slavery and others which we'll look at in the next topic. That's it for topics 4.1 to 4.3. The next video will look at 4.4 and 4.5, which are definitely the most dense parts of the unit. Until then, keep thinking like the college board.